Alright, how's it going everyone? My My name is McCain. I'm the state chair of Youth for Paul here in Colorado. Uh, just to start out, I want to thank Ron for taking time out of his busy schedule to make by see our beautiful state. Uh, I want to thank the local chapter of Youth for Paul, getting a bunch of volunteers setting this up. That's really what makes it all possible. But uh, in the end, what I really wanted to thank was you guys uh, for caring enough about our country to you know see what it takes to support the guy that's actually going to fix it. So uh, you know. Four years ago, something like this, I never would have thought was possible, but uh, there's a lot of us here today, and there's more of us every day. So we're, we really are growing, and uh, we can achieve you know, peace, liberty, and prosperity within our lifetimes with you guys' enthusiasm. Yeah. But, uh, it's not just a lifetime thing. We can do that this year, but what it takes is for all of you guys to go out and actually show up at the Coxes. A week from today, 7 p.m., at the local level. You need to go there, bring your friends, bring your family, run as delegates, vote in the straw poll. The delegates are how we win. It's not over until August, and we need every Colorado delegate to be a Ron Paul person. So I really can't stress that enough. Each and every one of you you know, it's fun to sign wave, it's fun to come see a speech, but that is how we win. We need the delegates, and that's you guys. So, if you're not familiar with how the caucus works, they're going to have a training afterwards. Uh, it'd be really good, just quick information, uh, to make sure that we can actually win. But, uh, you know, together with all of us going to that state convention as Ron Paul delegates and voting for Ron Paul delegates to the national convention, we can be the people that put Ron Paul in the White House. Right, and now to introduce Dr. Paul himself, we've got our local event coordinator, Matthew Martinez. Good morning, everybody. I'll have to make this brief. It's wonderful to see so many liberty lovers out there, actually. You're all beautiful. Um, so now, before I begin, there's some logistics that need to be addressed. We have lost the foundation of liberty. If anybody happens to find the Constitution or Declaration of Independence, make sure it gets to Dr. Paul. But all kidding aside, we really have strayed far from the founding documents, haven't we? I know some of you are here because you feel that there may be a problem with the way the world currently is. We are here searching for a solution to that problem. The current system of control controls and hampers the infinite possibilities that every human possesses. We are here searching for answers to that problem. Some may find their answer in community outreach. Some may find it in education, dissent, or politics. Today, the solution is caucus. Now, by utilizing the all-powerful delegates, we can support Dr. Paul in his campaign for liberty and our uh, solution for freedom, excuse me. Now, Dr. Paul cannot accomplish the lofty goal of cracking the establishment alone. All of you here are more powerful and valuable than you could ever imagine. What some fail to realize is the message of liberty resides in all of us. Through our actions, through our actions and speech, we have the power to change minds and create a truly free world. Now, caucus. This is one of the single most important actions a liberty lover can currently participate in and surmount in the name of freedom. My wonderful volunteers situated around the room have plenty of literature and information available to those who'd like to change the world. There's no task too small, there are many ways to help. I urge you to reach out and learn how to, you, how to help Dr. Paul's campaign by becoming a delegate, for he needs every one of you to step up and shoulder the cause of liberty. Now this will be a long road but any fight in the name of justice is worthy of divine recognition and will always be vindicated. Now with that said, there's one man who still fights for us. There's one man who has become a beacon of hope for those of us who believe in a world more prosperous. There's one man who defends us from the monster that is the establishment. 
It is my pride and privilege to present to you Dr. Ron Paul. introduction and I love coming to the college campuses because uh, for some reason we get very good receptions on college campuses. But it, but it is an uh, important moment in our history of what's going on because there are great significant changes. Uh, in, in other words, I believe we're in a transition now from an economic system that was deeply flawed. We lived on borrowed money and borrowed time and printing press money and a pretense that we could do it forever. And about four years ago, it was discovered it was unsustainable. And now we have to face up to the truth, admit the truth, that once a country has lived way beyond its means, it's forced to live beneath its means. And now we have to make a decision on how to do that. And fortunately, it's not all that painful if we do the right things. All we have to do is return to our constitutional government and believe me, we can get out of this mess in a very short period of time. Of course, the, uh, it sounds pretty easy and I'd like it to be easy, but the big challenge is you have to challenge the status quo. There's a lot of special interests out there that don't want to rock the boat. When you come to the military industrial complex, you come to the banking system, the Federal Reserve System, and the welfare state, there's a lot of special interests. So the contest is going on right now between those who want to assume responsibility for themselves and uh, those who want to live off others. Those of us who want to take responsibility for ourselves and, and make sure that we can keep the fruits of our labor, believe me, if we win this, it will not be difficult. It will be a much more freer and more prosperous and more peaceful society if we can achieve that. We would have to ask one basic question that the founders asked when they were pretty upset with the king. They didn't like the role of government, they didn't like the role of king, and they did something about it. Uh, they knew exactly what they believed in. They understood, uh, they understood the classic. They understood up into that period of time what the history of liberty was all about. And they decided they didn't want to live under the king. And uh, there was a revolution. They wrote a document that was up until that time. And, uh, you know, the best. It's still a great document. The, the tragedy is, is we don't follow it. And uh, th this, is the, this is the reason that we must ask the same question again. What should the role, should the role of government be? The founders concluded that the role of government shouldn't be complicated. It should be to protect liberty. Nothing more complicated than that. That means protect the industry, protect the right for you to keep the fruits of your labor, to, to honor and protect property rights. If we did that, we would get back to our roots. But unfortunately, over many, many years, we have drifted away from the concept of individual liberty in a republic, and unfortunately, we have accepted the dominance of a democratic society where the majority dictates to the rest and undermines the individual liberty that we all should cherish. Fundamentally, we'd have to change the foreign policy, and, and a lot of time I'm accused, they said, Ron, you're doing real well, they like your economic policies, they like this sound money and personal liberty stuff, but you gotta get off this kick about your foreign policy. You know, and they said, because your, your numbers would grow tremendously if you would just adapt to the neoconservative warmongering group. <laughs> 
like you were out there and saying the one of the main reasons why you are interested in our campaign is because we do have a new foreign policy, one designed to protect this country but not to be the policeman of the world. for the last hundred years we would have fought a lot less wars because very simply no war should be fought unless they were declared and uh, unfortunately now now our presidents go to war without declaration without consultation and it's not one party that has that fault it's both parties have been doing this for decades that's why we need to renew our determination to strictly adhere to the Constitution, especially with the war power issue, and make sure that no president can go to war on his own and then pretends he gets the authority from NATO or United Nations. That is not so what would this mean? Economically, it would be a real boost in the last 10 years. Our national debt went up $4 trillion in the past 10 years because of fighting these wars. So there is an economic consequence of fighting wars. But of course, there is another physical com uh, and, and a life co uh, a complication for it too. People lose their lives. A lot of our people lost their lives. You know, if you add up all the lives of Americans lost uh, in these last 10 years, uh, both wars and you add up the contractors, it's almost 10,000. There's 30, 40,000 severe injuries. Hundreds of thousands of, of, uh, of military personnel coming back, begging and pleading for help. There's an epidemic of suicide uh, from the people who have served overseas. And it's because the foreign policy is deeply flawed and we have to change the foreign policy of this country. <laughs> It's all the current president's fault, and all we have to do is to change the president. But if you change the president, again, another president believes the same thing, it's not going to do any good. Matter of fact, uh, our foreign policy, unfortunately, was started by uh, Woodrow Wilson. That's how far back it went, because he said that it has our moral obligation to be an idealist and make sure the world is safe for democracy, and that we have this moral obligation to spread it with the use of force, and we've been in endless wars ever since. But the big difference now is we're bankrupt. You know, the Soviet system came down, not because we had to fight them. I was drafted to the height of the Cold War in the 1960s. They had 30,000 nuclear uh, weapons and missiles that they were aimed at us. We didn't have to fight them because they came down for economic reason, which was a predictable event by the Austrian free market economists. The socialism doesn't work. It always fails. On top of it, the Soviets had this empire, but they went one major step too far. They were so foolish as to invade and occupy Afghanistan. <laughs> and that is what brought them down. You'd think we'd learn a lesson. So here we are, bogged down. At the same time, you know, we're pretending the war ended in Iraq. It didn't end. Today, they're negotiating for sending more troops back into Iraq because it's not going well. I mean, we have a presence around the world. Nobody even knows. They asked about that the other day. How many countries are you in? He didn't want to have to stop and think, I don't know how many countries we're in. Well, the number is probably about 130. We probably have 900 bases around the world. And we are bankrupt and we can't afford it. We need to cut across the board. But I think the easiest place in the world for us to bring coalitions together is cut the needless, senseless wars and, and the presence we have around the world and just to mind our own business for once. be a blessing. We could do that rather rapidly. Matter of fact, since a president uh, uh, took us into these wars without proper permission, that means a new president who has the right attitude about it could in, in those rules, uh, in those wars as well, by just ordering the troops to come home. <laughs> And 
and without you know dismissing this military personnel immediately as they would come home guess what they spend all that money here at home might even be an economic stimulus by bringing all this <laughs> It, it has to have a change in foreign policy. People, people who do make the case and say, "No, Ron Paul, the dangerous person. He, uh, you know, uh, he wants to cut this and cut that. He actually wants to believe in the Constitution. What a dangerous idea that is!" <laughs> but, uh, but, but the whole thing is, you don't have to cut defense. You cut military. You cut all this activity that doesn't serve our interests. It undermines our defense, endangers us ourselves more so. So we would have more defense. A defense is a proper role for the government, and and we should have it. But if uh, if we equate any military expenditure with defense, that means nobody can cut anything. But I say you could bring people together and come up with economic common sense and common sense on foreign policy and, and change it, and that's where we could cut a lot of money. But my proposal is in the first year, it's feasible and necessary to cut the budget by a trillion dollars. <laughs> World War II, the budget was cut approximately 60% from what we were spending, and a lot of the liberal Keynesians said, oh, that's going to bring back the Depression, and there will be so much unemployment, we have to have a jobs program and do all, all these kind of things. But they, well, actually, after World War II, they cut, they cut the budget by 60% and taxes by 30%. And guess what? We finally got over the Depression, and jobs came back again. So this whole idea of government spending to create wealth, it, it failed when it brought us this crisis, and that's all they've been doing it for four years and, and we're not out of it. The question is, who gets to spend the money? And I would say if the government quit spending a trillion dollars and you get to spend the trillion dollars, maybe you would spend it more wisely than the bureaucrats in Washington. <laughs> But an important reason to be very keen on understanding uh, what the uh, wars do to us, it undermines our economy, and it undermines the more, uh, more, uh, moral standards of the people. It undermines our defense against personal liberties, because when wars are going on, the people are expected to sacrifice their liberties. But let me tell you, I've come to the conclusion that I firmly believe that there is never a need to sacrifice personal liberty for security. Never. <laughs> Too many people believe otherwise, especially since 9-11, there's been this idea that, oh yeah, sacrificing a little bit of liberty is going to make us a lot safer. Well, I'll tell you what, all you have to do is look at a few of those TSA agents prodding people at the airport, and if you think that makes you safer, we have a big problem, but it doesn't make you safer. <laughs> after 9-11 and understandably we were all very, very concerned and it, 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 we should have reassessed our foreign policy and done a lot of other things. But the very first thing they did, the first bill passed through 9-11 was passed a bill that had been floating around for years and they couldn't get it passed because the uh, environment wasn't right. But as soon as the post-9-11 environment occurred, they brought it back out and they passed that terrible bill called the Patriot Act. Should never have been passed. If we truly want our liberties back, we should start by repealing the Patriot Act. <laughs> another member of Congress when we were voting for this, I said, why are you voting for this? You haven't even had a chance to review it. We only had one hour. And he said, well, how can I vote against the Patriot Act? How can I go home, you know, and tell people I voted against the Patriot Act? And I said, there's a lot of bad stuff in it. He says, well, I know that. He says, but how can I explain it to him at home? I said, well, that's your job. Go home and explain it to him. <laughs> 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 if, uh, if that bill would have been called Repeal the Fourth Amendment Act, then I had a lot harder time. Essentially, essentially what it was. 
But you know, it hasn't gotten much better over this last decade. Personal liberties were too careless, and that's why this movement, this freedom movement, is so crucial. We need to reverse this attitude that we can just allow governments to codify now some of the terrible things they had been doing all along. The governments have been acting outside the law, but at least they knew that we would object, and they kept it quiet, and they did it secretly, and they'd use the CIA to overthrow governments and a lot of other uh, things that they shouldn't have been doing. But now, what, what have they done? They, the president a year ago, he announced that it is proper policy and official policy of the United States government for the president to make a decision to assassinate American citizens. <laughs> charges or without a trial. He's tested it. It's been done three times. So it's that principle that counts. Why do we have trials for bad people? To make sure that we're never subject to those kind of trials for political reasons. But you know, we, we give trials, you know, after World War II, uh, the Nazi war criminals were given trial. Adolf Eichmann, even years later, when he was arrested, was taken to Israel. He was given a trial. Timothy McVeigh, he was a pretty bad guy. I mean, they just say, oh, you're a bad guy. You know, we gotta, you don't deserve a trial. But that's, that is what has been accepted. And if you don't think it's a trend, you know, just this past month, they came on the National Defense Authorization Act. The National Defense Authorization Act has literally codified and said openly that the military can arrest any American citizen because you're a suspect. And that wasn't bad enough. What else they said was, you definitely don't get an attorney. You are denied an attorney. You are put away indefinitely in a prison which could be overseas. Now, they put that down in black and white. So that should alert us to you know, the crisis that we're facing. And it all can be solved by understanding the Declaration of Independence and our Constitution. Yeah. That come in a natural way or a God-given way, and if, it come, if our life and liberty comes in that manner, the government can't take it away, can't take our rights away. And if we believe that the government has the authority to be arbitrarily, uh, you know, arbitrary in, in enforcing these laws, then we're in big trouble. But the government's role should be very minor, that is to protect liberty, not to be able to undermine what is naturally ours. <laughs> Atmosphere exists. It covers, carries over into the domestic scene as well. I detest all these wars, especially since they're unnecessary and dangerous and unconstitutional, and unwinnable for a few reasons. <laughs> but the other war that's going on that we have to address is going on for about in a significant manner for about 40 years, and that's the war on drugs. That's unwinnable, and we should cancel it. history, a lot of motive, well-motivated individuals uh, discovered that alcohol could be dangerous. And I agree, alcohol is a very dangerous drug. Matter of fact, it's a lot more dangerous than some of the drugs that uh, are on illegal lists right now. But uh, the, the, the alcohol, there was a consensus. At least they, at, can you imagine them going through and amending the Constitution to pursue the drug war now? No, they just do it. But back then, they had, a, they wanted to prohibit alcohol. They at least I respected the Constitution. Well, we have to amend the Constitution. And it turned out to be a total disaster. After one decade, they chucked it. They said it isn't worth it. The crime related to alcohol and the sale of alcohol, and there was no decrease in the use of alcohol. So this, this is the reason that prohibition, prohibition doesn't work, and we have to take care of these problems in another manner. Drugs are very dangerous, but there's a lot of dangers in, in this country and in, in the world. And whose, respons whose number one responsibility is it? It's the parents to teach their kids what are dangerous. We teach them that oh. But the, but the 
the main reason it undermines personal liberty is it's used to once again violate uh, due process of law and uh, the Fourth Amendment. Uh, the uh, uh, the, the o operations when the police come or the FBI come and these SWAT teams come in, uh, they don't always go into the wrong, the right houses. Sometimes they go into the wrong houses. Some people get killed over this. Uh, but it, as a physician and somebody involved in politics, I think we should treat the drug problem, which is a serious problem, treat it more like we treat alcoholism. If, what if we put all the alcoholics in prison and said you're a criminal? I mean, that, nobody wants to do that. That's because they still drink a lot of alcohol over in Washington, D.C. <laughs> Um, every, every reason to believe that uh, something big is going on, the economic crisis is going to demand changes, the failure of our foreign policy brought down all great empires when they overextend themselves. That is coming to an end. Personal liberties here will have to make a decision whether we can stand watching on TV pictures of the TSA prodding and probing and us complacently obeying to this without saying anything. So we are at a crisis point, but fortunately, the liberty movement is alive and well, and that's what it's about. I'm encouraged, as discouraging as it is to be in Washington and listening to the politicians there, which I had suggested the other day that maybe we should send a few of them to the moon. <laughs> encouragement around the country. When I come to the college campuses and the young people are saying enough is enough and we want we want our lives back, we want our liberty back and we will assume responsibility for ourselves. We don't believe in the welfare transfer system and we don't believe in the warfare that is going to promote American goodness around the world. If we want to pr promote American goodness around the world, which isn't a bad idea because there's still a lot of goodness in America, the only way you can do it is set a good example and get other people to want to emulate us. That's right. But uh, a lot of people are coming alive with this. I'm especially encouraged by the younger generation. But I'm encouraged with others who have not been involved in politics. They dropped out a long time ago. They knew and understood this, but they felt like their numbers were so small. But because the younger uh, generation is coming alive, those who have set aside these and had given up, they're coming back into the fold and they understood it. They were just too frustrated. So there's a large number of people. There is truly an intellectual revolution going on in this country and I'm glad I can participate. about my uh, admonition that we should have uh, you know a free society and people make up their own minds what they want to do with their life and, and with their liberty because they're afraid they might misuse it sure they might misuse their money but that doesn't justify socialism they might misuse their social values and mess, mess up their lives but the whole thing is if you legalize freedom you don't legalize everything people do with their freedom we don't, if somebody, if freedom of religion is legal, and we don't tell people what they have to believe, some people will be non-believers, and some people will believe things that seem rather absurd. But we don't have to make that judgment. Legalizing freedom doesn't mean that you endorse what people do. That means we all should come together to endorse freedom, not what we do with our own freedom. Free society, you want to change and, and uh, change and mold society, but you do it through persuasion and not by force and through and through excellent education. I believe one of the personal goals that I would like to maintain, and I think others do, and that is if you want to seek virtue and excellence, which should be a noble goal. You can't let government get participating in that. The politicians and the bureaucrats don't know anything about virtue and excellence. <laughs> society when the government officials decide they want to do it they only do it at the expense of, of liberty but we we are now facing a major crisis there's every reason to be optimistic freedom had been best tried here we had the greatest success 
the largest middle class, the wealthiest middle class, and yet it's gone by its way. We don't have sound money, we don't have free markets, we don't have property rights, we don't have personal liberty. But we knew what it was like. We have a record to go back to. We don't have to invent it. It's not quite as difficult as other nations. When they break down, they don't quite have our traditions. <coughs> but it won't come easily because there's still a lot of powerful special interests that rule Washington. This is what we've turned it over to be. Once the government could divvy up the loot that they take, it just, just encouraged all the special interests and the lobbyists. They're in charge. We have to challenge them, and we have to defend this, and it has to be a moral cause as much as anything. We have a moral right to our life and our liberty, and we have a moral obligation not to tell other people what they want to do with their life and liberty. against what would happen. The founders made a very specific point. They didn't like pure democracy because that became a dictatorship and rights became arbitrary. And they wanted a republic, but they said they worried that it would uh, change. And I believe we have morphed into the dictatorship of, of the majority. And therefore, rights are, are, are relative and the minority is not protected. So if you're in the minority, you believe in true liberty, you're under attack by the majority who wants to control your life. But uh, John Adams said that what happens when you have pure democracy, it wastes and it exhausts and then it murders itself. And if we continue to be neglectful, that's what we're going to do. We're going to murder our liberties, we're going to exhaust ourselves physically and, and, and uh, economically, and, th and, and then uh, the authoritarians can pick up the pieces. The question is, are we going to allow that to happen, or are we going to insist on the traditions of America, understand what true liberty is all about, and get our freedoms back once again? That is what I stand for. That is what I argue for. That is what I campaign for. And I welcome you in this effort to restore liberty to America. Thank you. Thanks for watching everybody. Uh, be sure to get out, go to caucus. Let's make it done. Let's make it happen. Thanks. Good job. We'll talk soon. Yep. Yeah, buddy. Yeah. Did the screening work okay? Yeah. Turn it off real quick. It did.